written? I don't know. We probably shouldn't touch it because I don't know. No, but Sasha might know. Sasha, Sasha's the microphone expert among other other things. So they're color coded. So did you guys walk here, or did you take a subway, the metro? What you rode? You rode the, rode a school bus. Is good morning. I have to tell you, I have had a lot of fun standing back there for the last couple of minutes and listening to your questions and your energy, because I have a feeling the next hour is going to be a lot of fun. So my name is Lee M. Potter, and I work here at the Library of Congress, and I get to officially welcome you to the Library of Congress this morning. So officially welcome. <laughs> and I also have an opportunity to welcome an audience that is elsewhere around the country and around the world, because we're live streaming this event. Um, so that the questions you ask are probably questions that other children have in mind, and you're kind of speaking on behalf of all those other kids today. So I know your questions are going to be great. And in addition to welcoming you to the Library of Congress, I get to welcome you to the Young Reader Center here at the library. If you have been to the Library of Congress before, can you raise your hand? Okay, about maybe a third of you. Those of you who've been here before, have you been to this room before? All right. Well, those of you who haven't been, this room is sort of like the children's room in your local library. What sorts of things, psst, what sorts of things are in your library at your school? What else? Shelves. Shelves and books, and what's on the walls? Um, what's on the walls is... <laughs> I like that answer. You said more books, but sometimes there's pictures, and sometimes there's posters, and all kinds of fun things on the walls. You had something to say. There... And on the wall, there is pictures of people. That's right. And their culture. Excellent. Yeah, sometimes there's pictures of people, and sometimes those people are authors, and sometimes those people are famous people, and sometimes those people are you guys. And I bet some of your artwork is on the walls in your library. But here in the Young Reader Center, we have lots of books, and we have posters on the walls, and we have opportunities to do all kinds of activities with young people, like today, when we have a very special author with us. Now, I know you guys all know what authors are, right? Yeah. What do authors do? They write the books. That's right, they write the books. Does the author also illustrate the books? No. Sometimes. Excellent answer. That's right, sometimes. Well, in this case, I, you know, I have a feeling all of you are authors too. Have you guys all written stuff? Yes, yeah, I bet you guys are. Well, how, when you guys read books, or when somebody reads you a book, how often do you think about the person who wrote the book? See, that's my wish for you today. I hope that after this opportunity to meet an author today, I hope that every single book you read from now on, you think a little bit about the author and the illustrator of the book. Because when you read a book and you make a connection to that book, you're making a connection to that author too, and that's really special. And you're also making a connection to everybody who's ever read the book or ever will read the book. And that's really special, too.
So I am delighted to be welcoming Shana Corey here to the Library of Congress. She's going to be talking to us today about a very special book that she wrote recently about John F. Kennedy and a very important speech that he delivered in 1963. Now, John F. Kennedy, if he, had been, if he were still alive, would be celebrating his 100th birthday this month. Do you guys think 100 is a long time? Yeah, no, this month is his birthday. His birthday would have been at the end of the month. Now, you, you are just itching to say something. I'm going to call on you, and then I'm going to ask you really nicely to put your hands down so we can really get started, okay? Now, what was it that you wanted to say? Um, sometimes, on the, sometimes people paint the walls. Yes, that's right. In libraries, sometimes people paint the walls. That's so true. You guys are all going to have a chance to say things later, so I'm going to ask you, please put your hands down. Let's give a very warm welcome to Shana and welcome you, and thank you, and we're so excited to hear from you and also hear about the artwork that is also here that your colleague contributed to the book, so thank you. Thank you. I am so excited to be here, you guys. This is a Library of Congress. This is like mission control for libraries. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm here today because I'm an author, but I wasn't always an author. Do you guys want to see a picture of me before I was an author? Yeah. Okay, this is me. You'll like this. This is me. This is me when I was about your age, maybe first grade. Does that look like me? Yeah. Does it? Do, would it look like me if I had a big red hair bow? No. no? Well, let's see. You know who I think I was really drawing? I don't think I was really drawing myself. You know who I think I was really drawing when I was drawing this? Who was that? Madeline. Madeline. I love Madeline. So Madeline's this great book. I bet there's copies in the backyard. So if you take one pro tip from today, if you want to learn to draw a big hair bow, Two, two triangles, and boom, you have your hair bow. So that, that's your first takeaway from today. Do you want to see what I really look like, though, when I was your age? Yeah. OK, this is me when I was in elementary school. Which one am I? OK, raise your hand if you think I'm the sweet, happy, nice little girl with braids. No? no? Ra raise your hand if you think I'm the kind of bossy, cranky-looking big sister. Yes. What, you guys? OK, you're right. I'm the bossy. OK, hands down. I'm the bossy big sister. That's me. That's me and my sister, Marcy. Now, I wasn't an author yet in that picture. Can you guys hear me? I wasn't an author yet in that picture, but I was already doing something that was getting me ready to be an author. What do you think I was doing when I was in first, second grade that was getting me ready to be an author? What do you think? Reading books. Oh my gosh, you guys are such smart kids. Usually people don't get that right away, but yes, I was reading. I love to read. Raise your hand if you love to read. Oh, good. Well, then you guys, you're all on your way to being authors because reading is the most important thing you can do if you want to be an author. So when I was growing up, these were some of my favorite books. Little House on the Prairie, Betsy Tacy, All of a Kind Family. In fact, I liked reading so much that when I grew up, I decided I wanted to have a job where I could be around books all day long. Can you guys think of any, what kind of jobs could you be around books all day long? Um, at the library. You could work in the library. You could be a librarian. And then can you imagine this would be your office? And I bet you could take home any books you wanted. That would be pretty cool, right? No? What? You work oh, for the other people? What kind of book jobs can you think of? You can be an author or, or an il illustrator. You could be an author or an illustrator, so you could write or draw books or draw the pictures. What kind of book jobs can you think of? Um, I think you could be, you could be around books so by painting pictures. You could paint pictures, like the illustrator of this this book, our Gregory picture, our, our Gregory picture, our Gregory Christie, he painted these pictures. So he's around books all day, and then he draws the pictures. That's pretty cool. We'll do one last book job. What kind of book job can you think of? Um, one last book job that I can think of is organizing books. Ooh, that's a really good one, organizing books. Do you think, do you think librarians organize books? Yeah, that's a really smart thought. 
offer because of your earrings. I'm wearing book, book earrings, it's true. Um, so I decided to get a job, hold on to your thoughts because we'll do lots more in a little bit. I decided to get a job being something called an editor. Does anyone know? What's an editor? What's an editor? Oh, interesting. So yeah, that's part of what an editor does. They make sure lots of people are going to get copies of the books. What else do you think an editor does? And I'm sorry, I, didn't, I should have repeated your, your answer so people, uh, our friends far away could hear. Um, he said that an editor makes copies of books so lots of people can read them. And what else does an editor do? I think, I think an editor... Um, I don't know. So I think an editor is a lot like a teacher. Do your teachers help you make your work better? Yeah. Yeah. So, so an editor works with authors to help them make their stories better. So I got a job as an editor. Here is my office in New York City. I work at Random House Children's Books. And it's just like I always wanted. I'm surrounded by books all day long. So you guys might recognize some of these books. I work on books for big kids. I work on early readers, and a lot of the early readers I work on are about history because I love history. I see someone pointing, do you know that book, George Washington and the General's Dog? Yes. yes. I, I love that book. That's an excellent book. These, so those, it's really good. I really recommend it. Those books are true stories. Who can tell me what's it called when a book's a true story? Does anyone know what's a book, what's, what's it called when a book's a true story? Um, they, um, they also paint walls when they um, read the book to children who don't have books. Oh, people read books to children who don't have books? What, what were you going to say? What was the question again? What's it, called, what's it called when a book is a true story? Fiction. Whoa, really close. Nonfiction. Yes, exactly. Nonfiction. And fiction is something that's made up. Exactly. Okay, so I also work on books. I've worked on series like Baby Mouse and another series that you guys wouldn't know, I don't think. N no one's ever heard of Judy B. Jones, have they? You know Judy B. Jones? Oh, I love Judy. You have it. I have it in my backpack, too. I love Judy B. Jones. So, you guys, after... After I had been editing for a while, I decided I wanted to write my own stories. Now, when you guys write stories, where do you get your ideas? Where do you get, where do you get your ideas? From your brain. Sometimes you just get ideas from your brain. Where do you get your ideas? Let's see. Where do you, where do you get your ideas? I sometimes get ideas from books. From other books? That's a great place to get ideas. Where do you get your ideas? Um, some, um... So sometimes I get ideas from maybe my journal writing or poetry. That's fabulous. Yeah, from journal writing or poetry, that's a great place to get ideas. Where do you get your ideas? I get my ideas from other books because when I read a book, it makes me think of what I could do. That's this is, you guys are, have such great ideas. So she gets her ideas from her journals and poetry and other books because when she reads books, it gives her ideas of other things she could do. Where do you get your ideas? Pictures. From pictures. Looking at pictures is a great place to get ideas. Okay, we'll do one more. Is there anyone that hasn't? Well, do you. Pictures and facts. Pictures and facts. That's a, are you guys sure you're first graders? These are really good answers and thoughts. Yeah, facts. And I get a lot of ideas from facts because I write a lot of nonfiction. So I'll tell you about, you, can we, you write nonfiction too? That's, I love nonfiction. So let's put hands down for a second and I'll tell you about some of the stories I've written and then we'll read the one about JFK. Um, so a lot of my stories... A lot of my stories, can you hear me, hon? A lot of my stories are about real people, about people that inspire me. And I get inspired by people who do things to create change, like things that are going to change, that want to change the world. So some of my first books are about real ladies that lived a long time ago and they didn't like the kind of clothes women wore a long time ago. 
What kind of clothes? What Does anyone know anything about olden day clothes? What kind of clothes did ladies wear a long time ago? I know, they was wearing dresses that would show your body parts. <laughs> they were wearing dresses, long dresses, any other? What else do you know about olden day clothes? And um, sometimes they would only wear ca- hats because um, they were only allowed to wear hats. They, they had to wear hats and bonnets a lot of times. In fact, are any of you guys going to go swimming this summer? Yeah. Yeah? Are, yeah. Are, you, are, are any of you going to wear a bathing suit that looks like this? No. No? no. Well, a long time ago, women used to wear bathing suits that looked like this. Like but, but girls, you're going to wear tights, right? You can't go swimming without tights, right? No. no? Well, Annette Kellerman, the woman on the right, was a real lady that lived a long time ago, and she was a champion swimmer. And she thought, we can't, you can't win races and, and set swimming records in those kind of bathing suits. So she invented her own bathing suit. So I write about a lot of people like that. That's how bathing suits were invented. I also write, I write some books that are historical fiction. Does anyone know what's historical fiction? Any guesses? Um, historical fake. That, that's exactly right. Historical but fake. So some parts are true. There's some facts. And some are made up. So I'm going to tell you which parts of this are true and which are made up. Players and Pigtails is about a real baseball league a long time ago. The All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. It was the first girls baseball league. And it started during World War II. All of this is true because all of the boys that played baseball went off to fight in the war. And President Roosevelt wrote a letter to the commissioner of baseball. Roosevelt, and he said, you have to keep baseball going. So I did, so they started a girls league. So I did all this research for this book. Here's real pictures of the team. Here's another real picture. But I had a problem. Hold on to your thought. I didn't know who to write about because I had all the facts about the league, but I didn't have a main character because there were so many people that played baseball in this league. Hold on to your thought. But... Then I went to the library because you can always find facts and answers at the library, right? Right. So I, w- I found this old book in this, this secret room, this room on the third floor of the library by my house. I don't even know if I was supposed to be up there. It was this dusty old book. And I pulled it out, and I blew off the dust. And when I read it, I got goosebumps because this old book had the song. Does anyone ever know the song, Take Me Out to the Ball Game? Yeah! Can you guys well, all together say, say just the first line of the song, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, all together? Take me out to the ball game. Okay, hold on to your hats, folks. Guess what? That's not really the first line of that song. When I opened that book, I couldn't believe it. There's a whole verse that comes before that. And that's the kind of stuff you can find when you're researching in libraries. The real first line of that song is, Katie Casey is baseball mad, had the fever, and had it bad. And when I read that, I got goosebumps. Because that means that song that everyone sings and knows and thinks of when they think of baseball, that song is really about a girl. That's pretty cool, right, girls? I think that's really cool. So I, de- so I decided to make Katie Casey my main character. So that's why that book is historical fiction. The facts about the league are true, but my main character is made up. I've also written a book about the first subway in New York City. And before I tell you about that book, I just have a question. Has anyone ever seen litter in the streets? Yeah. Has, has anyone ever yeah. been stuck in traffic? Yeah. Well, believe it or not, the litter in the streets, especially in New York City, was even worse 150 years ago than it is today. In fact, it's so bad, I don't even know if I should show you a picture. Your teachers might get upset. You, it's so gross. You sure you want to see it? Okay, this is what the litter looked like 150 years ago. So this, this was before street cleaning, before recycling, before alternate side parking, and the streets were a mess. So this, they were gross. And in fact, can anyone tell me, how did people get around 150 years ago before there were cars? How did they get around? Um, horses pulled people in carts. Yes, 
Horses pulled people in carts. So if there were a lot of horses on the street, what else do you think was on the street that horses produce? What do you think? Poop. Yes, horse poop. So the streets were really, really gross. There's another picture. Also, they hadn't invented things like stoplights. That's a picture of Broadway in New York City in the 1850s. They hadn't invented stop signs or stop lines, stop lights, or even lanes. Look, there are no lanes in that picture because traffic was new. So this man named Alfred Eli Beach had an idea. He was going to invent a subway. So have any of you ever read, rode the metro here? So Beach wanted to invent, though, you just did. He wanted to invent a different kind of subway. He wanted to invent a subway that ran on pneumatic power. Does anyone know what pneumatic power is? OK, I need, do you know what pneumatic power is? Pneumatic power is that the subway stays on forever. The, the subway what? Stays on forever. Stays old forever? Stays on forever. That's a really good thought. Would you be my volunteer? I need someone to come volunteer and demonstrate pneumatic power. Come, come up here. So are, are you really good at science? Yes. OK, we have a scientist here who's going to demonstrate pneumatic power for us. Can you take this and blow it? Whoa. So, so I have a question for you. I didn't see you take your hand and move that. What force did you use to move that? Wind. Wind, air, and that's what pneumatic power is. It's air power. So, so Beach used air power. You want to hold on to that? Here, let me hold on to it. You can have it at the end. Thank you so much. Can we give her a round of applause? So Beach used air people to move his subway back and forth. Now, the book I'm going to read today is a book about this person. Who is that? John F. Kennedy, who would be 100 at the, end of, at the end of this month. And he inspires me because he's a real person. And he, he had a decision to make if he was going to be brave and stand up for something he believed in. So should we read the story and see what he did? Yeah. Yes. OK, I'm going to let's see if I can put this here so I can turn the pages in my book and read a little up closer. Yes. OK. A time to act. So do you guys, what's it called when a book is about a person? Do you know the name? What kind of book is about a person? Yes. Um, no? Is that you? Biology. Close. Biography. You guys are such smart kids. Biography. So this is a biography of John F. Kennedy. So it's also nonfiction. And I'm going to read it here and turn the pages. John F. Kennedy loved to read about history. But history isn't just in books. It's happening all around us. And the people who make history aren't just famous leaders or characters and stories. They're real people, just like you. Sometimes they are you. John, or Jack as he was called, was the second of nine children in a big, rich family. If you saw the Kennedys, you might think they had everything. But take a closer look. Jack wasn't the favorite. That was his big brother, Joe. Their father wanted Joe to grow up to be the president. No one was sure what Jack would be. Jack didn't always do well in school. He is casual and disorderly and can seldom locate his possessions, said one of his teachers. And he was often sick. But Jack was funny, and people liked him. When Jack was too sick to play outdoors, he read. Jack's mother taught her children the importance of giving back to one's country. Jack took that belief seriously. When the United States entered World War II, he joined the fight. On August 2nd, 1943, an enemy ship ripped into the boat he commanded. Jack led the survivors to safety, towing one of the injured for more than three miles by the man's life belt strap. And he carried the life belt strap in his teeth while he swam. Wait, what about that other page? That other page? I'm reading. I'm not reading the whole thing because I want to make sure we have time for questions and for me to show you how it became a book. Jack's brother, Joe, also served his country, but Joe wasn't as lucky as Jack. A year after Jack's rescue, Joe was killed flying over the English Channel. The family was heartbroken. Now it was up to Jack to carry out his father's dreams for Joe. In 1946, Jack ran for Congress. His whole family helped. After six years as a congressman, Jack was elected to the Senate. 
Americans loved the handsome young senator and his new wife, Jackie. They were celebrities. Soon after they were married, Jack had back surgery. While he recovered, he wrote another book with the help of his staff. Profiles in Courage told about people who had the courage to take a stand for things they believed in, even when they weren't popular. Have you guys ever done something really brave? What? Have, have any of you guys ever done something that you feel like is really brave? What have you done that's really brave? What? Because Jack was interested. He wrote a whole book about people who did brave things. Um, I ran to the pool and I didn't even know how deep it was. Going into a pool is really brave, especially if you're if you're not sure about it. What else have you done that's really brave? Um, I have a nine feet pool and. I jumped into the deep feet, even though that I was scared. Oh, wow. Jumping into a pool is a really brave thing. You guys are a bunch of brave kids. So hold on. We'll do, we'll do more in a little bit. On January 2nd, 1960, Jack announced he was running for president. Hold on. I'm juggling a lot of things. For president of the United States, years of patient, have practice had turned him into a powerful speaker but not everyone thought he would win. Do you think it would hard, be hard to, to run for office if people were saying you couldn't win? Yeah. yeah. He was 42 years old, younger than every, any president who had ever been elected before. President Dwight D. Eisenhower called him that young whippersnapper. Eleanor Roosevelt thought Jack's father was spending too much money to help him get elected. My dear boy, she telegrammed, I only say these things for your own good. And Jack was Catholic. Many people believe the country wouldn't elect a Catholic. I believe in an America where religious intolerance will someday end, said Jack. That is, that is Ruby Pictures. Look, the picture's right before, behind it. America was also in the midst of a long, hard struggle over civil rights. Civil rights are the rights of all people to be treated fairly without being discriminated against. In many places, black people were not treated fairly. In the South especially, a system called segregation kept black people apart from white people. Even though the Supreme Court, and did you guys pass the Supreme Court on its way here? It's on the way here, it's just right down the street. Had declared it illegal, black people were not allowed to go to the same schools as white people. They were not allowed to drink from the same water fountains or eat in the same restaurants or stay in the same hotels. Black people couldn't always get the same jobs as white people and sometimes they were kept from voting. Many Americans, both civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and others who weren't famous, even students, even kids just like you guys, were trying to change that through peaceful protests. Have any of you ever been to a protest? Yeah, that's really exciting. So you guys, if you've been to protest, you're already part of history. You're part of history, just like the people in this book. You, You've been to a protest, so you're working to change history and to make history. That's how you make history, by being part of it. And you guys are already doing that. The, the women's march? Wait, so you went to the women's march? So we can show Donald Trump that we're... Um, that love is stronger. And that you made a sign? That says, you made a sign? That says, love is stronger. That's fabulous. So you're part of history. You guys are changing history. You're making your voices heard and, and telling people how you want our country to be. Good job. Good job, all of you. So here's some more kids that were part of protests. Just a month after Jack announced he was running for president, four college students in Greensport, Borough, North Carolina began a sit-in. So does anyone know what a sit-in is? Yeah. It's, it's a protest when you're, when you're sitting to make a statement. So I'll read about it. They sat quietly and peacefully at a whites-only lunch counter and waited to be served. They were refused. Every day, more and more students joined them. By the end of the week, the sit-ins had spread across the country. Turn the page. Yeah. 
That October, Martin Luther King was arrested and sent to prison after participating in a sit-in. His wife, Coretta Scott King, feared he would be killed. Jack's campaign worked secretly with Georgia's governor to get Dr. King released. Some of Jack's advisors worried that would cost him the votes of white people who didn't support civil rights. So do you think that stopped him, or do you think he still wanted to help Martin Luther King? But Jack telephoned Dr. Mrs. King. If there is anything I can do to help, he said, please feel free to call on me. On November 8, 1960, Jack was elected the 35th president of the United States. Hold on to your, can you hold on to your thought for a minute, and we'll do questions at the end? In some things, the new president acted quick. Whoop. What? Thank you. And some things, the new president acted quickly and used bold words. He established the Peace Corps and challenged young Americans to go out into the world and work shoulder to shoulder with people in other countries. The United States and the Soviet Union were rivals competing to be the strongest. The Soviet Union had already sent a man into space. Have you guys heard about the space race? Yeah. Yes. Jack declared that the United States would be the first to land a man on the moon. But on other things, in important civil rights issues, Jack was slow to act. He had once declared that the president must be willing to get in the thick of the fight, but now he seemed unwilling to fight some battles. I would like to be patient, the famous baseball player Jackie Robinson wrote to Jack, but patience has cost us years in our struggle for human dignity. So he's moving really fast in some things, but in other things he's moving a little slower, like on civil rights but others were taking action. And that May, despite the danger, hundreds of black children and teenagers once again stood up and acted. They left their classrooms in Birmingham, Alabama, and singing songs of freedom marched peacefully to, pro to protest segregation. They were hauled off to jail. But the next day, even more young people arrived to take their places. So in the civil rights movement, a lot of young people were right at the forefront. They were the ones making change and saying, we, we have to do something different. We have to make our voices heard. Americans, including Jack, saw the young people's courage on the news and were sickened by the violence. On June 11th, two black students applied to enroll at the University of Alabama. Alabama's white governor pledged to block them. Again and again, young people had shown their courage. Do you think Jack's going to act now? Yeah. Jack had to act. And finally, following in the footsteps of those who had set the course by sitting in and sending letters, marching and riding buses, he did. Jack ordered the National Guard to escort the students safely into school. And that night, in living rooms and kitchens and diners across America, millions of people of all colors, children and parents and grandparents, rich people and poor people, people from the North and people from the South, people of different religions, people who'd looked the other way and people who'd fought for change, turned on their television and radios and heard the president speak. This is some of what the president said. So he made this very important speech on civil rights. He said, 100 years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. This nation will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. Now the time has come for this nation to fulfill its promise. It is a time to act. So that's where that title comes from. So after that speech, Martin Luther King and the baseball player Jackie Robinson sent Jack telegrams and letters and said, good, they basically said, good job. Jackie Robinson said, the presidential statement on the color question is one of the finest declarations ever issued in the cause of human rights. Because presidents hadn't really said that before. Sometimes they had said, oh, you know, we need to end segregation, but they had never really said that it's totally and completely wrong. They had, they had made it sound like it was about politics. And Jack Kennedy was the first one that said, no, it's just wrong. The following week, Jack sent a strong civil rights bill to Congress. So do you think he sent it almost right across the street to Congress in the Senate building right across the street? It's pretty cool that you guys were right in the place where all of this happened. 
President Kennedy was killed on November 22, 1963, just a, few minutes just a few months after he addressed the nation on civil rights. But his legacy, his words and actions live on. Today, the Soviet Union no longer exists, but young Peace Corps volunteers still go out into the world, building roads and bridges, libraries and schools. On July 20th, 1969, Kennedy's Space Challenge was met. Two American astronauts walked on the moon. And on July 2nd, 1964, with the help of many courageous people, people who didn't give up, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was finally passed, making it illegal to discriminate in jobs based on the color of one's skin and providing for the integration of schools and public places. Hold on one second, and then we'll do questions in a little bit. In the 50 years since the bill was passed, there's been much progress on civil rights, but there have been step backwards too. History isn't a straight line, and it's not words written in books and permanent ink. It's changing. We're changing it every day. You guys, when you go to protests and things, you're changing history. From here on out, you are the decision makers, Jack once told young people. You are the writers of history. And so now it's your turn to choose your course, to speak up, to act, to move the world forward, to make history. So kids your age can and have made history. You guys are part of history. So I was going to show you guys, do you want to see how this story became a book? And then we'll have time for questions. So I'll show you. When I first wrote this, the first thing I do is I look for inspiration. And you guys were talking about where you get your ideas. And someone said pictures. I get a lot of ideas from photographs. These are some of the real pictures of John F. Kennedy's family. I know you guys saw some Kennedy memorabilia upstairs. Did you see pictures? Yeah. Yes. So he's the second oldest. Here's another picture of his family later. He's right in the middle in the back. But even more, as much as I was inspired by John F. Kennedy, I was even more inspired by the people he was inspired by, the people that were really creating the change, those brave kids that were showing their courage by protesting. Who knows? Who, who is that? Does anyone who, who? Everyone knows. Who is that? Ruby Bridges. You guys, I can't get over the, these kids. They are so smart. Yes, that's Ruby Bridges. So she was the first black student to integrate in elementary school, right? What were you going to say? Why did she have to go to the white kids' school? You know, that's a really good question. She wanted to. She, wasn't, she hadn't been allowed to. But usually the schools that the white kids went to had better resources. They had more money. So they, 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 she wanted to have the same things that her parents wanted to have because she deserved just as good an education as everyone else, right? That's a really good question. You know, have you ever noticed sometimes when some people think that, some people are worried that they're gonna, if they share with people, that they won't have as much? I, I think it had to do with that. Some people felt like they wanted to keep all the good stuff so they would keep the other people out and they, they felt like they wanted all the good stuff and yeah, it, it wasn't a fair system. The Supreme Court said it wasn't fair, right? And so now we can be together. I was also inspired, these are some of the real kids. Remember in the book, The March, when the kids left their classrooms in Birmingham and marched? That's called the Children's Crusade. Here are some of the real kids who marched, just like you guys when some of you said you had marched recently. And I was inspired by those kids. So when I started reading about Kennedy, I want you marched. I wanted to write about the kids that inspired him. So then I started writing. I also found lots of old documents. This is a letter John F. Kennedy wrote when he was a little boy. Here are some telegrams he got. There's a telegram from Eleanor Roosevelt that says, my dear boy. And then I started writing my rough draft. Now, my rough drafts are kind of messy. I don't know if I should show it to you there. You, yeah? OK, this is what my rough drafts look like. This was a rough draft for my baseball book. So if you were in a library and you could check out any book you wanted, how many of you would get that if you saw it on the shelf? Well, n not many, right? What, what's it missing? What does it need before it can be a book? What's it missing? Um, it's missing pictures and it's missing um, a, a, um, a front page. It's missing 
pictures, a title page. What, one more. What else is it missing? Um, it's also miss, missing the, the title. If it had a title, then it would actually be a book. If it had a title, it would actually be a book. Okay, one more. What else is it missing? What does it need before it can be a book? It could be a book with your name on it, and, and everything doesn't have to be ha uh, have uh, pictures on it. You're right. Not all books have pictures. You're, you're absolutely right. Not all books have pictures. But it is pretty messy, right? No. no. Should we do one more? What were you going to say? It's missing a period. Is it? It probably is. And I can't even tell. It's missing. I think it's missing correct spelling. It's missing pages. It's pretty messy. So what I do after my first draft is I revise. I, what, who can tell me what does revise mean? What does revise mean? You do it again. Yeah, I do it again. So I keep working on it to make it better and better. And when it's as good as I can possibly make it, I type it all neatly. Here's a typed up version of a book I did about the Girl Scouts. And I send it to my editor. Now, how many people think when I send my typed up, very neat spell check version to my editor, she says, it's brilliant. It's perfect. We're going to publish it tomorrow just like this. Is that what you guys think? Yeah. See, I think that every single time, and it's never happened. Instead, she sends it back to me full of ideas for how I can revise it more. You want to see what she sent me back when I sent her this? Yeah. So this is about Daisy Lowe, the founder of Girl Scouts. Here's what she sent back to me. If you look, all of those are comments about ways I can make this story better. I think in this one, the only thing she said I could keep was a main character's name, and that's only because it's nonfiction. It really was her name. Everything else she wants me to change and try to make it better, because if we're going to ask you guys to take your time to read it, we really need to work as hard as we can to make it good. And then the last thing we do is we send it to the illustrator. This illustrator's name is R. Gregory Christie for this book. And the illustrator does some sketches. So that's what his sketches look like before he does these beautiful paintings that you see behind me. And for covers, covers can take a really long time. Just like authors revise and revise to get, to get their stories right, illustrators revise and revise. Here is his art for that. Here's some of what, what Greg Christie did when he was working on the cover. This is what the final cover looks like put it here so you guys can see. But you can see these are some things when he was experimenting with different ideas, getting different ideas down. These are just, he was thinking maybe we should have Kennedy walking to the podium. Whoop. Sorry, a couple didn't come through, but so look, all these different ideas. But when we were talking about these, we had a thought. It's great to see Kennedy in these, but what was Kennedy's big inspiration that the book's about? Who inspired Kennedy? Yes, who inspired Kennedy? What does inspire mean? Inspire means who, who made him give his speech? Who? who? Yes, um, Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King. And also, who else? The kids when they were marching. And also the kids. But you're right. Martin Luther King wrote to him and said, you need to do more. And the kids marching him. And he saw pictures of those kids marching and being met by violence. And he thought, if they can do it, we, we have to do something. So... Our Gregory Christie decided, you know what, the kids need to be on the front cover too because they're as important as Kennedy in this story at least. So the final cover, here, let's see if I have the final cover up there, is that he brought the real kids and he worked them into the illustration because that, so ins inspiration means the thing that, that makes you do something. Um, so that was, that was Kennedy's inspiration. And that's everything I was going to tell you guys about today. Do you guys have questions for me? Yes, questions. Um, why did, um, if they were making a sign, why did they color the sign blue? Just blue oh, good question. I bet the real sign had, had words on it, but I would guess, you know, artists can all, they always, they can make their decisions on what they think looks the best. I think that it's probably, if you put words on it, it might distract from the title. That would be my guess as to why there aren't words on that sign. Good question. Yes. Um, um, so I kind of have an answer to Kai. So maybe since it's, so maybe that, so maybe the back of the sign was actually supposed to be blue paper. Oh, that's a good, because we could be looking at the back of the sign there. That's a good thought. 
Okay, we'll come back. To you. Yes. Why did he? Why did he? Did he have a funeral? Kennedy. Yeah. He did when he died, which was later. It was in November of the same year that he gave the speech. He had a big, big funeral. Any other question? Yes. What inspired you to write the book? To write this book? Um, I was interested in writing about Kennedy because I knew it was his 100th birthday. But what I was really interested in is I knew he was president during the civil rights movement. And I didn't know what his involvement was. I had always read about those two parts of history separately. I'd read about Kennedy, and then I'd read about things like the sit-in and Ruby Bridges, and I wondered what was he actually doing? He was a president. He had to be involved in it. And so I started trying to research and find out what he was doing. Good question. Yes. Um, what do you really like about um, in the book about Kennedy? What do I like in the book about Kennedy? I can tell you my favorite piece of art is, it's not here. It's a piece of art that's all the kids watching television. I find that really powerful because you see kids all over, different kids, you know, some kids from the south, some from the north, um, and I thought it must be powerful to have a president stand up for something that you know is right. Um, actually, did any of you guys, you probably didn't, th there's the book that Kennedy wrote called Profile and Courage, Profiles and Courage about brave people. There are awards, Profile and Courage awards, and they just gave them out um, this past week, and guess who got the Profile and Courage award? John of Good. Good idea. This year, it went to President Barack Obama. So that was cool. He was your favorite president? Well, you can hear his speech. He just, just this past week, he talks about Kennedy, which was neat. He's very famous. He is very famous. Yes? How come when Martin Luther King got shot, how come segregation, segregation end? You know, it didn't end right away. Like, it, officially it ended with the Civil Rights Act, and even before the Civil Rights Act, there was a Supreme Court case that said there shouldn't be segregation. But history, it can take a long time. Change happens slowly. I think we want it to happen faster, right? I, I know I do, but change happens. I thought that and he still got shot, that um, they would just end it right away. I know, it would be nice if it had just ended right away. I think it's also that you have to keep working for things, right? Because sometimes it, it's like we, we can relax and think something's all done. That's why in the book I talk about how like we have gone forward, but then we slide backwards too. So that's why we have to keep marching and protesting and for things we believe in. Yes? Why did, why did the guy shoot him in the first place? Because he was mad at him. Kennedy or Martin Luther King? Why was he mad at him? Martin Luther King. Martin Luther Because no, you met Kennedy? Yes. You know, there. He I, I think he just, I, you know, I honestly don't know. I think he didn't agree with them. But, or they're but, he didn't like the speech. It was, it was a little bit later. But I think a lot of times it's, it's dangerous being a president. That's why presidents have Secret Service, right? Have you guys ever seen Secret Service? Yeah, so now they, 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 they actually do a lot more safety things than they used to do. Like they don't have open cars and stuff so that, that presidents can be a little safer. But yeah, it's much better to, if you have concerns, to peacefully protest, right? Versus violence? Yes. Um, I, I know that I, so when I saw that picture, I, 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 I thought it, so I knew it was gonna be like that because on the book in the red writing it said it says John F. Kennedy's big speech. It does say that. So, so we had a lot of. I'll tell you a few little behind the scenes things about that picture. When when we first saw the painting, it was all in color. And that's something the artist revised, because we started thinking about it. And what do you guys know about televisions from a long time ago? What do you know about? You guys are so smart. Black and white. It was black yeah, a lot of TVs, most TVs were still black and white. So he had to go back and change the art, because we realized, wait, that probably wouldn't have been in color. Um, and we also did a lot of to the title, A Time to Act, comes from the speech he gave. Those were some of the words. And then we had to, we debated whether it should be John F. Kennedy's big speech or JFK's big speech, because a lot of people called him JFK. What would you guys have done? Fitzgerald. That was, 
Yes. Um, back then, TV was n not really invented. It was invented. And I, and I saw a real life TV way, way back then. And also something when I did brave was go underwater when I didn't even, when I was, when I didn't even want to do it. That is really brave. A lot of people did brave water things. Yeah, so TV was just invented. That's why, though, the book says a lot of people listened to it on the radio, because not everyone had a TV, and they definitely didn't have the internet. No one was live streaming the speech. But you know what, you guys? You can actually watch this speech. You can go online, and your teacher can find you. You can watch video of this actual speech. It's on my website or at the JFK library. Yes? Um. So not all the people who helped our country is black, not all of them. No, you're right. There, there were certainly, there were white people and other people that helped too, right? Allies? Yes. I, I know the last name of the person who killed John F. Kennedy. What? His last name is Oswald. You're right. Yes. What, mo what month was his funeral? You know, I would assume he died in November, November 22nd. I actually don't offhand know the date of his funeral, but I bet it was still November. The, you know the sit-in book? Is it the one the four friends sit in? I love that book. That's a wonderful book. There are wonderful books about the, about the sit-in. Um, yeah, there, there's a wonderful book about, there's several wonderful books about Martin Luther King. There's great books about Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges actually wrote a kid's book that you can find to read, when, which is interesting. I don't know if you guys are going to get to read books here after. Are they reading books? If not, I'm sure you can come back, and I bet you have a lot of these books in your school. Um, didn't the person who got um, who killed John F. Kennedy, didn't he get hanged? No, he didn't. He, he, but, he, but he was, it's a, that's a good, it's a good thought. He was actually, he was shot. He was someone. You guys, I think, know more about Kennedy. I know the who killed Oswald. Who killed Oswald? Jack Ruby. And there are books about that, too. That's the thing. One of the neat things about writing is you can write different things. So this book is really about Kennedy and civil rights. But there are books. I know lots of great books, too, that talk about his assassination. Um, there are some early readers that are really good about him, too, and other picture books. And Oswald also got arrested for killing John F. Kennedy. Yes. Yes. Person who killed John F. Um, the person who killed John F. Kennedy, and then the person who shot the person who shot John F. Kennedy, who shot that person. It's, yes, it was. It was a really intense time, right, of American history, because it was all. No, it, I don't. I don't believe it happened all on the same day. No. Yes. When was this book made? So this book, good question. It just came out last month. It was just published, but I, I, I really wrote it last year because it takes a long time for the illustrator gets to do their work after it's already written. So I wrote it, and then it went to the illustrator. Yes. Um, when, when did the 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 segregation end? Good question. So I believe with the civil rights, what, what were you going to say? I, I know when slavery ended. When did slavery end? 19, 1869. And I, know when, I, know. I know when the first dependence is. We celebrate on the 4th of July because that's when our first dependence was wrote in. You're right. You guys know such and George, good. And George Washington was in the fight. And George Washington was in the Revolutionary War and then was the first president? Yeah. Yeah. So I think segregation, it, was, it, it took longer to actually end than when it became illegal. Um, so we, um, so we kind of know this other person named Paul Revere. I kind of know about a person named Paul Revere too. 
It's part of American history. And Paul Revere has to do with the American Revolution, too. I think Paul Revere is very interesting. Yes? What be about? Good question. So right now I'm actually writing a book about Michelle Obama. Yes? I think this is the very last question. Was the person who killed JFK arrested? Yes, he was arrested. You guys have been a wonderful audience with fabulous questions and fabulous answers. Can you give yourselves a round of applause?